Welcome to Pax Britannica. Episode 19. Flushing it all away. Welcome back to Pax Britannica. Last week, we heard about the witch trials of James's English reign, and how his personal involvement raises some questions over quite how zealous the devil's greatest enemy truly was about finding and punishing witches. He was certainly concerned about fraudulent accusations, and prosecuted one such fraud in the court of Star Chamber. This week, we will be looking at the events following the death of Prince Henry, and what this meant for the Stuarts, as well as what was happening across the English Channel. Henry had been struck down by an illness, probably typhoid, as the preparations for his sister's marriage were being settled. Elizabeth was distraught. She had been incredibly close to her brother, and it was said that his last words were asking for her. Not even the presence of her betrothed, Frederick of the Palatine, was much help, and now her marriage was marginally less certain. She was now second in line to the throne, and there had been those at court, including her mother, Queen Anne, who believed that Frederick was already too lowly for a princess, even before she had been suddenly promoted up the line of succession. Further, there were suggestions that the marriage might be delayed until the following summer, in order to allow for a respectable mourning period. This would be bad news for Frederick, who could not stay that long, and anything could happen in the months he was away. Without his presence at court, it is possible that the critics of the marriage would win out, and a higher-born spouse found for the princess. As it happened, he needn't have worried. James hated gloom and misery, despite surely being distraught over his eldest son's death, and had grown very fond of his proposed son-in-law. The king insisted that Frederick and Elizabeth marry, and insisted that the celebrations go ahead as planned. For her part, Queen Anne withdrew, and absented herself from events over the next few months, complaining of gout. Just under two months after Henry's death on the 6th of November came Christmas, and two days after that, on the 27th of December, Elizabeth and Frederick were affianced and contracted, formally engaged to marry, in the banqueting house in Whitehall. James was present, as was Prince Charles, but Anne was, as mentioned, unable to attend due to gout. It was a very fine occasion. Charles was dressed in purple velvet and gold lace, Elizabeth found a middle way between celebration and mourning by wearing black clothing decorated with silver lace and white feathers. This seems to have sparked quite a fashion, and contemporaries complained that white feathers hiked in price after the event. In respect for the late prince, the ceremony itself was less grand than might be expected. James kissed the couple and gave them his blessing, and they listened to a functionary, Sir Thomas Lake, read words from the Book of Common Prayer. Frederick was, however, not fully fluent in English, and so Sir Thomas read the contract out in French. The problem was, it turns out that for as bad as Frederick's English was, Sir Thomas's French was worse, and so bad was his attempt to translate that the engaged couple, and most of those present, burst out laughing. The solemnness of the occasion couldn't have helped, and when the giggles showed no sign of subsiding, poor Sir Thomas gave over to the Archbishop of Canterbury, George Abbott, who finished the ceremony in, one would hope, much better French. And it was done. Or at least, the betrothal was official, and Frederick was now styled Prince Palatine and included in prayers for the royal family. He ran with the role, giving generous gifts to Lord Harrington, Elizabeth's guardian, as well as all of Elizabeth's ladies-in-waiting. He gave them 
medals with his picture, which is a bit odd from a modern perspective. To his new in-laws, Frederick was even more lavish. Charles received a rapier and spurs, both decorated with diamonds and inlaid with gold, while James received a bottle made entirely out of a single precious stone, with Anne receiving a matching cup, which is quite nice. To his new betrothed, he pulled out all the stops, showering her with jewellery and precious stones. Not literally, of course, that would be quite painful, and this was only the betrothal. They were yet to be married, and the Palatine side was very keen on setting a date. It was finally agreed, after much debate, that the wedding would be held on the 14th of February. No expense was spared for the marriage. A single gown for Elizabeth cost £200, and the master of the wardrobe was granted £3,000, quote, for provision of necessaries for apparel for the Lady Elizabeth's grace. And it sounds like he needed every penny. Alison Plowden, in her book, The Stuart Princesses, lists most of the garments prepared for the princess, quote, She had gowns of ash-coloured silk grosgrain, brocaded with gold and silver, of sea-green tissue, russet cloth of gold and white cloth of silver, petticoats of green satin brocaded with gold flowers, of carnation and murray satins embroidered with gold and silver, she had a lap mantle and cloak of tawny velvet, lined with fur, riding dresses of brocaded satin, hats of felt and beaver, bodices with great sleeves of the Spanish fashion, and negligees lined with carnation wrought satin. Everything was wrought or embroidered, loaded with Venice gold and silver lace, with Spanish and Venice silk ribbons, with goldsmith's work, fringes, tassels and spangles, as demanded by the current fashions, end quote. Plowden further explains that fashions had changed slightly. The stereotypical Elizabethan ruff was gone, surely to the disappointment of Lord Percy Percy, replaced with lace collars. Bodices and the farthingale, the huge dresses, remained, despite them becoming something of a problem in large numbers, such as, say, at a royal wedding. They took up too much space, you see, and ladies tended to get stuck in narrow doorways, which was not particularly glamorous. The festivities themselves were extensive. In the weeks before the wedding, a fireworks display would be launched from the Thames, while the river would also host mock battles, including floating castles. Vessels from the fleet arrived to take part, and otherwise be displayed at the occasion. These riverborne displays were said to cost £6,000, but were apparently unimpressive. The fireworks were a letdown, while the mock battle became slightly too real for a few of those involved. One was blinded, another two were maimed, losing one or both of their hands. A few days before the wedding, Sir John Chamberlain wrote that over 500 musket-armed soldiers were present in the city to guard the royal family during the festivities, as well as London's notables squabbling with one another to be the most involved in the event. He also wrote that the Queen was said to be warming to the wedding, and that, quote, "...there is hope she will grace it with her presence." On Valentine's Day, the wedding took place. The princess's procession was lengthy and circuitous, so that as many people as possible could bear witness to the event. Both Palatine and Princess were wearing cloth of silver, with Elizabeth wearing a coronet and her train being carried by her ladies-in-waiting. The vanguard of their procession was Lord Harrington, Prince Charles, and the Earl of Northampton. The wedding ceremony itself took place on a specially constructed platform, with Frederick's family represented by his uncle, Henry, Count of Nassau, and Elizabeth by her brother, father, and, thankfully, her mother, Anne having finally attended. George Abbott, the Archbishop of Canterbury, conducted the sermon in English, as Henry had learned enough of the language to do his bit. The two were married, and to cheering crowds, the royal couple returned to the banqueting house. When James visited them the following morning, he was sufficiently assured that the marriage had been consummated. The week following the marriage was one of parties and revels, masks and banquets and processions. 
On the 10th of April, 1613, the royal family departed on a barge down the Thames. They were seen off by crowds of cheering Londoners, and the reception was likewise positive when they reached Greenwich Palace later in the day, staying for the next few days to greet well-wishers and make their goodbyes. By the 14th of April, they were at Rochester, where the king and queen would leave the group. James, rather unfairly, made his son-in-law promise to give his daughter precedence over himself and every other German noble, and Frederick did so. How could he not, in a situation like that? Charles stayed with his sister until they reached Canterbury, remaining with them for a week before the weather was good enough to sail. At this point, Charles left, and Elizabeth would never see him or her parents ever again. Elizabeth and Frederick reached Margate on the 21st of April, where their ship, the Prince Royal, awaited. The Prince Royal had, of course, been a gift for the late Prince Henry. I don't know why this particular ship was chosen, and perhaps it was for other reasons, but I can't help but think that there's something poetic or symbolic about her beloved brother's ship, named after him, sailing her away from England. Four days later, the party boarded the vessel, and, helmed by the Earl of Northampton and accompanied by the ever-loyal Harringtons, Elizabeth and Frederick departed England. She would not return to the country for almost 50 years. These marriage celebrations and everything they entailed were expensive, and only added to the eternal bother of James's English reign, money. Shortly after the wedding, James made the decision to dissolve the English household assembled for Frederick. The Privy Council, despite obviously being distraught at the death of Prince Henry, could see a silver lining from a financial perspective. The prince had been showing signs of being just as much a spendthrift as his father, if not more so. His expensive household, which had continued to grow in both size and cost, was disbanded, giving the royal finances some unexpected and obviously unwelcome room to manoeuvre. The king could still rely on many of the methods arranged by the late Salisbury, such as the impositions, which were already earning the crown over £70,000 a year. Parliament had, as we've seen many times, been wholly unhelpful as far as James was concerned, and his debts were steadily mounting. Until the winter of 1614, the crown was in negotiations to marry Charles, now heir apparent, to the young Princess Christine, sister to Louis XIII. Not only would this bring a powerful alliance with France and protect James's kingdoms from its nearest neighbour, but it would bring a huge amount of cash. James hoped for more than £200,000 in a dowry, which would almost half the crown's debts in one fell swoop. Sadly for James's purse, events intervened. Discussions were put on hold, as instability in France reared its head once again. A faction of the nobility was on the brink of rebellion against Marie de Medici, regent for her son. By the end of the following year, 1614, the marriage discussions were ended. This was likely a boon for the pro-Protestant members of the Privy Council, who sought further alliances with Lutheran and Calvinist princes on the continent, rather than closer links with Catholic powers. Among this group could be counted the Earl of Pembroke and the Archbishop of Canterbury, George Abbott, in opposition to the broadly pro-Catholic Howards, including the Earl of Somerset, James's then favourite, who was married to a Howard. We'll discuss the political strife between these two quasi-factions next episode. Only quasi because it would be a mistake to see them as solid political blocks. Anyway, instead of seeking financial health in a Catholic marriage, Pembroke and Abbott suggested instead to call another parliament, because the last one went so well. The king was convinced, however, and so the 1614 parliament was summoned. The fact that I just called it the 1614 Parliament might hint at how successful it was, as might the name by which it's known to history, the Adult Parliament. Now, considering that James's first English Parliament was called the Blessed Parliament, and that was hardly a triumph, imagine how bad the Adult Parliament is going to be. 
Bonjour, comment ça va? Happy New Year, everyone. Yes, it's that time of the year when people make resolutions. They want to read more, exercise more, or learn a new language. Clearly, I've chosen the latter. And I have Babbel, the language learning app that sold more than 10 million subscriptions, to help me. So, it's French for me in 2022. But like all of you, my schedule is already full. No problem. Babbel is fun, engaging, and its bite-sized language lessons, about 15 minutes, are for real-world use. In other words, it's doable and practical. My two favorite things. And you know that you're getting the best with Babbel, as it was created by over 100 language experts with proven effectiveness, and its speech recognition technology will help improve your pronunciation and accent. And there are 14 languages to choose from. As I am a child at heart, I like Babbel's podcasts, games, stories, and videos, not to mention the live classes. But best of all, to put you at ease, there is a 20-day money-back guarantee. All reward, no risk. Start your new language learning journey today with Babbel. Right now, when you purchase a three-month Babbel subscription, you'll get an additional three months for free. That's six months for the price of three. Just go to Babbel.com and use promo code RECORDEDHISTORY. That's B-A-B-B-E-L dot com, code RECORDEDHISTORY. Babbel language for life. The problems began at the top. The Privy Council, Sands Salisbury and a healthy Northampton, did not adequately prepare for the Parliament. The position of Speaker a vital instrument of controlling the proceedings, was given to Ranulph Crewe, a relative unknown, while Sir Ralph Winwood, now the Secretary of State, had no experience in Parliament at all. These two primary methods of government involvement were insufficient for the task at hand. But then again, the King didn't help matters much either. His last experience of Parliament had been poor, and he immediately refused any notion of bargaining or compromise, which is not a good start. Quote, Where a contract begins, affection ceases. I hold the affections of my subjects to be the best purchase. End quote. Now that's all well and good, James, but you are several hundred thousand pounds in debt. The Commons were equally unhelpful, as they immediately returned to the eternal issue of James's rule, as far as they were concerned the king's spending, and his attempts to raise money through extra-parliamentary means, including the hated impositions. The commons would not budge unless the king stopped overstepping his rights by infringing theirs. The king would not stop exercising his royal prerogative until parliament provided an acceptable alternative. The late Conrad Russell put it like this, Both sides were so firmly convinced that they were legally in the right that they never fully absorbed that the other party thought differently. The adult parliament lasted only nine weeks. A final warning came to the commons from court that, unless they agreed to provide for the king's financial need without condition, parliament would be dissolved. John Hoskins, a judge and opponent of royal overreach, who had spoken against the king in the blessed parliament, responded to this demand in a, let's say, undiplomatic way. His anti-Scot prejudice was virulent and well-known. In 1610, he had argued that the king was only in debt because he was sending England's money to Scotland. In 1614, he followed this sentiment up with a criticism of royal financial policy and a suggestion that all Scots at court be sent home with the implication of violence if they were not. James demanded that the Commons distance itself from Hoskins, and when they did not, he had the man and three other MPs arrested and thrown into the tower. Hoskins would stay in there for a year and become quite friendly with the long-time Tower of London resident Sir Walter Raleigh, still imprisoned since James's accession. Not to worry, he'll be out soon. Despite Hoskins' release, his repeated and abject apologies, and the intervention of friends and family, James held a strong grudge against Hoskins and sabotaged his career. 
After he was elected mayor of Hereford in 1616, the king explicitly cancelled his appointment by royal letter. Parliament, now proven to be unreliable as far as James was concerned, was dissolved. Since it had only existed for nine weeks and hadn't actually passed any laws, it technically wasn't even a real parliament, just a parley, as one contemporary put it. James publicly destroyed parliamentary papers in Whitehall, and famously told the Spanish ambassador Gondomar that, quote, The House of Commons is a body without a head. The members give their opinion in a disorderly manner. At their meetings, nothing is heard but cries, shouts, and confusion. I am surprised that my ancestors should ever have permitted such an institution to come into existence. Along with their other concerns, the Commons in 1614 had also been fearful because of events in Ireland. The year before, in 1613, James had expanded the Irish Parliament by an additional 84 seats, when it had only had 148 before. Most of these new MPs were representing places of plantation, with 38 of these seats allocated to Ulster alone. Some of these seats didn't even have planters yet, and their MPs were representing just the ground which has been designated for plantation. This threatened the existing status quo. The Irish Parliament had been dominated by the Old English for centuries, who were still largely Catholic. This gerrymandering allowed the Irish Parliament to have a Protestant majority of 32. The Old English were not happy, to say the least especially when it was revealed that there were plans to introduce further anti-Catholic legislation. Under the proposed bill, Catholic priests would be banished and laymen fined for sheltering them. A petition was dispatched to London to beg the king to reconsider. It promised that tolerance would be the best way to assure peace in Ireland for every group. James ignored it, and when Parliament met in May, the Catholic members abstained from the opening ceremony. As a petition had not worked, a delegation of Catholic peers went to London to see the King, while in the lower house, members brawled over the choice of Speaker. A Catholic candidate sat in the Speaker's chair, with a Protestant candidate on his lap. How about that for compromise? The delegation, meeting with James the following April, was harangued by the king for their disloyal behaviour, calling them half-subjects because their loyalty was to both him and the Pope, and dismissing their concerns over the increase in MPs with the more the merrier. Three months later, though, the king softened, reducing the increase in seats and the Protestant majority to only six, and cancelling the proposed bill. When the Parliament next met, they were overly polite and calm, and even proposed a vote of taxation in 1615. Nevertheless, James, completely disillusioned with parliaments, and the Irish Parliament in particular, had the body dissolved in August 1615, and refused to call another Irish Parliament for the rest of his reign. So, in lieu of taxation or subsidies, how was James to fund himself? I mean, It isn't like he was about to starve or anything, but the debts kept mounting. The impositions were bringing in more and more revenue into the royal coffers, as trade improved with Europe and the rest of the world, as we will see next week. This was good, but it wasn't enough. One such method of raising funds was a benevolence. These were, essentially, forced loans without actually, or even pretending, to pay them back. As you might imagine, they were unpopular, and had been for a long time. Richard III tried to make use of them, but Parliament abolished them. Henry VII used them, as did his son, because why would they care what Parliament said? But that had been it. No English monarch had demanded a benevolence since 1546. Until 1614. James demanded a benevolence, and despite there being protests and petitions, partly because benevolences were meant to be used in times of national emergency, and there wasn't one, the funds were collected, and totaled around £65,000. 
James would repeat this the following year, and twice more in the 1620s, and each time they would cause more and more outrage. Another possible source of income came from the reform of the Merchant Adventurers Company. We talked about them back in episode 3. They exported English wool, mostly to the Netherlands, where it was dyed and sold on. The wool trade had exploded after the end of the Anglo-Spanish War and the truce between the Dutch and the Habsburgs, which was signed in 1609. A London alderman, Sir William Cocaine, or Cocaine, proposed to James that the merchant adventures were missing a trick. Since most of the profit and employment was in dyeing the wool, why should this be done in the Netherlands? Cocaine suggested that the company be dissolved, and in its place should be a new company, the King's Merchant Adventurers, headed by Cocaine, of course. The wool trade would continue as before, except the cloth would be fully processed in England before it was exported to Europe. This would, he estimated, bring in an additional £40,000 a year into the treasury through employment and the duties on the more expensive products now. The Dutch wanted English wool, and they would pay higher prices. Only, it didn't go like that at all. The new company had nowhere near the capital, resources, or connections of the old, while the Dutch did not take this lying down. This had been an established trading partnership for literally centuries, and the English could not just unilaterally change the deal. As it turned out, English woollens were not as treasured as they used to be, and the market for them had already been declining. So in the face of English intransigence, the Dutch just banned its import entirely. Over the summer of 1616, there were riots of weavers and other elements of the cloth industry across England. So, despite the king showering cocaine with honours and praise, it was clear to all that the alderman's plan had completely and utterly failed, and in 1617, the old merchant adventurers were chartered once more. They paid £50,000 for the privilege, and so James still got something out of the fiasco, but the wool trade would never reach its former heights again, especially considering it had already been declining. The whole episode only hurt the reputation of James's government even further, yet another example of the king's impulsive abuse of royal prerogative. Around this time, James's desires to be financially solvent began affecting his strategic interests. At the end of 1615, the Dutch provinces proposed that England return the cautionary towns held by the English since the Treaty of Nonsuch in 1585. These had been the ports occupied by Elizabeth's soldiers as a guarantee that she was not entering a war with Spain only for the Dutch to leave her high and dry. They doubled as securities on English loans to the United Provinces, which by the time of the Dutch proposal totaled more than £500,000. James sold them back for half that. For £250,000, the towns of Brill and Flushing were returned to the United Provinces. Hence the terrible pun of today's title. Croft proposes that it was the looming cost of Charles becoming Prince of Wales that helped James come to his decision. There was the immediate cost of the ceremony, which occurred on the 3rd of November 1616, as well as the heightened household expenses that would follow. The sale of the cautionary towns was unpopular on the Privy Council and in the larger kingdom, both for the financial loss as well as for its sacrifice of the English position in the Netherlands. Thank you for listening to today's episode of Pax Britannica. Remember that Pax Britannica is on Twitter and Facebook if you want to keep up with the show. Thank you to my House of Lords. The Royal Headsman, executed today. Her Grace, the Duchess of Devon, Michelle Gersage. The Most Honourable Marchioness of Scullion, Lady Jennifer. The Right Honourable Countess of Surrey, Jean Buckley. The Right Honourable Countess of Shrewsbury, Elaine Dickens. The Earl of Oxford, Christopher Grogan. The Earl of Somerset, Brendan Bonner the Right Honourable Countess of Cornwall, Belinda Clarence, and the Right Honourable Earl of Hereford, Christopher Remo. If you want to join their ranks, go to patreon.com slash Pax Britannica. 
Every patron gets an ad-free RSS feed, which you can put into any podcatcher. Alternatively, if you want to support Pax Britannica without spending any money, recommend it to a friend or share it on Reddit, Facebook or Twitter. Remember that you can get in touch with me through those latter two, or by emailing me at podbritannica at gmail.com. Finally, thank you to Sounds Like an Earful for providing the music used in today's episode, to my entire House of Lords, and to you for listening. <laughs>